Hi folks, I'm Steve Arabato. Um, I recently moderated an important, compelling conversation. It's, it's called the Reimagined Child Care Town Hall Meeting around the child care crisis. That crisis involves staffing. That crisis involves access, affordability. There's been a child care crisis going on for a long time. The pandemic has only made it worse. This is an important, compelling conversation. We ask you to check it out right now. Steve Adubato here. We pick up our conversation on our reimagined child care town hall. Um, this very distinguished panel has been talking about that. If you missed part one, go on our website, check it out. This is part two. Um, I, I want to I ask this question. This whole issue of solutions, people say, how do we fix the child care crisis? Um, so my question, Winifred, is this. Do we actually fix it? Or do we take a whole series of actions governmentally, from a societal point of view, family point of view, et cetera, et cetera, and make improvements in it? We don't actually fix this crisis, do we, Winifred? No, we need to um, completely reimagine it and, and rebuild the infrastructure of it. What does um, that mean? I'm sorry for interrupting. Re we're using the expression reimagine child care. We've been doing it for a couple of years now. What does that mean to you? fund early care and education as a public good. The same way we fund K through 12, you should fund zero through five. Well, hold on, you said as a public good. What's the difference between a public good and, and, public, and a public service? So I do believe it's both, right? So a, a child care allows families to work, right? Um, and without it, families can't work. Like it's real simple, right? If, especially for people who have children zero to five. Um, so that's the that's the service that we provide. We also make sure that our children are socially, emotionally, cognitively, and um, academically prepared for their next part of their journey. Funding it as a public good means that we would use the money the same way you would use money to fund K through 12 or the firefighters or the police department is the same way you would fund the early care and education sector. By the way, this is Ed, who is a parent from Elizabeth. Um, he asked a very important question regarding single parents. I want to talk about single parents and this child care crisis. And by the way, to all those who sent us video questions and also went on Facebook and Twitter and responded to our social media outreach asking, what one question would you ask about child care? I'm sorry, we're not going to get to all those questions. But this is Ed, a single parent from Elizabeth, New Jersey. How can single parents be expected to afford what a two-income household would afford in terms of quality child care and covering their rent or their mortgage? Cecilia, a single parent versus uh, a so-called intact family or a two-parent family, whatever that means to different people. Talk to Ed, please, and, and, some, and countless others who are in a comparable position. So I think when we talk about reimagining child care, how we assist parents afford child care, I think is critically important. Um, we have a state child subsidy, child care subsidy system, which we've discussed. It doesn't serve, it serves families at very low incomes. That system needs to be strengthened so that families at higher incomes are eligible for help. It needs to have a much easier application process. I mean, that's a, a kind of a long-winded way of saying we have to do better by families. To Winifred's point, this is a public good. It keeps families working, it keeps the economy moving, and it provides education for young children at the most critical time. We have to do more to create a system that supports all aspects of it, including parents. I'm curious about something, and I want any one of you to jump in here. Is there actually a child care community, a child care network, if you will, or is it simply a series of child care organizations just all trying to survive, pay their bills, pay their work? You're, you're smiling, Winifred, as I do that. Um, Assemblywoman, is there such a community and a network, or is everyone just fighting for survival? I, I think that on um post the pandemic, everyone has come together. Um, organizations like ACNJ, the Alliance for the YMCA, we have had dozens and dozens of hearings on 
Um, just last week, um, many advocates um, met with the front office, the governor's front office. The, the governor's office is the front office. Yeah, the front office, yes. Um, and, uh, unfortunately, he was not available because of what happened with the storm. Um, and I have to tell you that- um, By the way, excuse me, we're taping in, in September. The storm is that storm. We're praying there's not another storm. Right. But I just want to put that in context. Pick that, your, your comment up, Sam Elman. Right. So um, we had a number of advocates, probably over 20 advocates on the phone, including ACNJ. Again, just repeating the same. Child care is too expensive. We have a staffing crisis, right? Um, the staff, the, st the child care staff are not paid. Um, they're paid minimum wage. And right. how do you live? A, how do you live on minimum wage when you're earning twenty five? But, but it was a community. Of, I'm sorry. It it's was a community. community. Yes, a community of advocates and parents, and so we are coming together finally this past year. We are fighting hard, fighting hard to ensure that we're, um, you know, subsidies are paid on Roman and not attendance. That yep. we that the which is in fact your legislation. That as yeah. we speak is sitting on the governor's desk. On the governor's desk, right. correct, and that on. Um, the staff, staff are paid more because if you look at the public sector, public schools, they're paid, I don't know, $35,000, $40,000 and above. While well, we're making minimum wage to child care staff, right? Um, well, while we say our children are our most precious resource, those are. who care for them are being paid minimum wage. It, minimum wage. And also, you, they're not receiving medical benefits. So there's a lot going on right now. And this is why I'm super thrilled that there's a lot of ruckus going on right now, that the advocates are coming together, that we're fighting for our children. And actually, I also understand that about 50% of the uh, women, these are women, they, they can't go to work. They can't go because they can't afford childcare. So 50, about 50% 50 of women in this state cannot go to work because they can't afford childcare. And it's just not fair. Um, but I want to ask Dr. Lee something uh, following up on what the assembly is saying, and it's not the first time it's been raised. In your view, Dr. Uh, Lee, how much of the lack of appreciation, lack of, frankly, respect to those who are on the front lines in child care organizations caring for our children, how much do you believe it is a product of the fact that they are disproportionately women? And many of them are women of color. Historically, right, you can imagine kind of any professional field that are primarily staffed by women are shortchanged in wage and recognition and in respect. And I think one of the things that I hope we collectively all understand, right, is that over the last 20 years, there has been bipartisan support for investment in early childhood. But when it comes to childcare, we're still lagging behind, and we have this ongoing challenge on compensation, quality, access, affordability. And in part, I think it's not only just an underappreciation of the people who work in the sector, but also a misunderstanding of how social investments work. We talk so much about kind of how invest early, right? Reap economic rewards and other benefits for society as a whole. But anyone who has done any kind of an investment, even just for your retirement portfolio, have to understand, but you actually have to make the initial investment. <laughs> and that initial investment has to be of a sizable proportion. So all the economic studies that told us about 12 to $16 return for every dollar invested in early childhood, in all of those initial studies, the, the, the staff are well compensated and the services are integrated rather than isolated. The staff are supported with professional development and recognition. And those are efforts that were done in the 60s and 70s and 80s. So the idea that if we want to join together to invest in early childhood, then in addition to look at how great the return is going to be, we actually have to be faithful to how much it is that we need to invest up front in order to get that kind of return. And that investment starts with investing in the people who are caring for the children. You know, we talk about the state level and the assemblywoman talked about uh, her legislation. And by the way, is there a second piece of legislation, assemblywoman, that is worth uh, acknowledging? I just want to uh, ask yeah, you that. I do. And, you know, uh, so working closely with um, ACNJ, thank you, Seal, again. The Associate Advocates for Children of New Jersey. 
Just to clarify that, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was a former board member for 10 years. <laughs> yeah, so um, I introduced A5731 providing a gross income tax credit for licensed child care and family um, care centers. Um, this bill is designed to provide tangible incentives for individuals working in child care. And although um, expending state dollars is a worthwhile investment, it is an industry that is crucial to our economy and recovery. You know, so I, you know, I'm very grateful to um, the um, Advocates for Children of New Jersey for walk me through this process, helping me with this. Um, and so we've introduced that as well. It's, um, I don't think it has, um, it has not been posted yet. However, um, I'm hoping not that- Not been posted for a vote. I just want to be clear. Right, when for a vote, not correct, posted. yeah. Right. As we speak, it's not posted for a vote. Let me ask you, uh, real quick on this, because I know that State Senator Teresa Ruiz, who is uh, a mom of a young child and a whole range of other women who happen to be in the legislature, who happen to be um, moms have been driving this. Do you sense, and I know this is tricky to ask you this assemblywoman because you have to work with your male colleagues and I don't want to make this a male versus female thing, but to what degree do you sense that your male colleagues are as committed to this cause as you and some of the other women in the legislature Unanimous. are? Unanimous. You they're sense it. They're 100%. Is it, bi is it bipartisan? Yes. 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 So, 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 Seal, where's the resistance then? Why is this so hard? If it's unanimous, if it's universal, um, by the way, not universal child care, that's another story. But my question, Seal, is why is it so hard then? Well, I think the, the feedback we've gotten certainly is it's too expensive to implement. But as Assemblywoman Lopez points out, this has a safeguard in it. It allows the state to assess in two years what's the financial impact. And uh, you know, back to something you said early on, Steve, let's not forget that New Jersey is getting $700 million of federal money specifically for child care, in addition to money that's going out to local communities, to the school districts that could be used for child care. We're still waiting for our state to put out what its plan is for that money. Talk about reimagining child care and uh, Dr. Lee's point about you have to make the investment up front. We have the money to make that investment. How are we going to use it most effectively? If that were to happen, Winifred, and by the way, Winifred Smith Jenkins, senior director is 80s, uh, nurturing Den. Check out our, our first part of this town hall if you missed it. She talked a lot about her organization. If that were to happen, Winifred, what Cecilia just described and the assemblywoman described, what would it mean for you and your colleagues at Zadie's Nurturing Den in terms of what you could provide those children and their families? So I think if we could take a step back, what could we bring to the table for the for the staff, right? Um, you could professionalize the benefits that the staff are receiving. You're talking about medical, you're talking about dental, life vision, um, retirement benefits, because science essentially tells us that the key to quality is the is the workforce. Is the are the they don't have it. I'm sorry to go, they don't have it now. No, so not necessarily. It's too it just, expensive. I want everyone to think about what's being said. And again, my job is not to advocate or be on a soapbox. Everyone at the Caucus Educational Corporation are full-time staff. There are health benefits, there's a pension contribution they make and we make. And it's not us, just think of most organizations. That is the norm. What's being said is it's not the norm in the childcare industry. And I'm just trying to understand why that is the case other than Winifred precedent. So you have to remember that we truly are small businesses, right? Like there's there's no, you, so you either get funding from the subsidy program or, you know, we could call it state tuition, right? Or you get funding, you get paid through parent tuition, but that's it. Like that's the, you know, that's the so only way you get no paid. There are no other sources. No. So that's the problem. And, and, and you can charge an exorbitant amount, but who can afford it if you do that? It's just a catch 22. It is. Um, and by the way, the question, we, we're, it's a lot of social media questions. And again, we'll put up our, our Facebook uh, page and our, our Twitter handle as well if people want to continue asking questions and we'll, we'll continue this conversation offline. Many people asked um, when we put out the social media question as what, what is the number one childcare question you would want to ask this distinguished panel? 
as part of this reimagined child care at Town Hall. Here it is. How exactly can we establish free universal child care, not just in New Jersey, but in the United States of America? What needs to be done to make that happen? Seal, take it on. So we have an opportunity. Again, we have the federal money that can help seed that kind of idea. It's going to require a future state investment for sure, but we have that money. And you know, New Jersey, I think more than any other state in the country, is well placed to do this because we are ahead of the rest of the country in our high quality universal preschool program. Where's, where's the Biden administration on this? I think they're very supportive. Um, I think the the federal ARC funds, the American Rescue Plan, uh, takes the first step toward this. There's more uh, federal funding being debated. Uh, I think, again, it's how do we use it most effectively? Actually, we know what to do. We have some great models here in New Jersey. Again, preschool, uh, our preschool program is I think the best in the country. We can look at the lessons learned from that to Winifred and the Assemblywoman's point to create a true birth to five system of early education for young children in our state. Assemblywoman, jump on this. You said there's universal across the board bipartisan support in the state of New Jersey and the state legislature for the kinds of things we're talking about. What is your sense? You're not in the United States Congress, but you have a sense of things nationally. <sighs> With so many things being politicized and so many different parts of our country geographically seeming to believe different things for different reasons, to what degree do you believe that there's universal across the board support, bipartisan support in the United States Congress for the kind of reimagining of child care that we're talking about, Assemblywoman? I, you know, I could speak for the legislature, okay? Uh, and I'm going to talk to you about the legislature. Go ahead. So, okay. So obviously we have 120 members, right? And I would tell you that any 40 senators, 80 se members of the state assembly. Per correct. And anytime there's a bill that is introduced, whether it's in the Senate or in the assembly, whether it's on the R side or the D side, there is 100% support for those bills. Why? Because so many of our members either have children or, are, or have grandbabies, yeah, and they understand. They understand the struggles that parents go through with tuition. Um, again, childcare being too expensive. They understand um, how they have to make a, diff a, a choice. Do I go back to work and have to pay this enormous rate for childcare, or do I stay home? And so understand that in the legislature, we have 100% bipartisan support for all these child care bills and um, pieces of legislation. But that's in the state legislature. I, and I want to go to Jackie uh, from Scotch Plains who has a video question. But, but Dr. Lee, I need to ask you, what is your sense from a national perspective? It's one thing to say that the Biden administration is supportive. And we're not a show about politics. We're a show about policy. And so my question is, from your vantage point, what do you see nationally? And you do look at this nationally, doctor. To what degree, while the Assemblyman's talking about this universal support in the state legislature, both parties geographically across the board, men, women, doesn't matter, all in. Do you see something comparable to that in the United States Congress as it relates to child care? What I see, uh, Steve, I think across the country, across both blue and red states and anything in between, is that there's a growing consensus, I think, on um, two things, whether you base it on science or just based on common sense. One is this idea that you can't make a lasting positive impact on children by skipping over the adults that are in the middle. And these adults are the educators, caregivers, and the families. Right. That is as much common sense as, as it is science. And then based on that principle, we can think about how do we legislate, how do we fund, and how do we prioritize. And the second part, and, and the pandemic particularly reminded all of us that, which is that all of us value families, no matter what state we live in. And then if we value families, we have to recognize that families don't just thrive on its own as a little bubble. When things happen around the world, families need support. So that infrastructure of support around the families, supporting that is the same as valuing families. 
And in that context, for families with young children, the childcare infrastructure is an absolutely integral part of, of the support that families need. And these two fundamental principles ought to be the kind of things that can bring us together and figure out the financial and policy solutions that can get this done. I want to, as I said, we had so many video questions that, that came in. This is uh, Jackie from Scotch Plains, correct? Jackie talks about, um, well, let Jackie speak for Jackie. Let's go to the clip. When the pandemic started, I was forced to stay home. How can New Jersey support working parents? Yeah. Seal, do you hear that? So I think we've talked a lot about ways to reimagine childcare supporting staff. But one, one thing that I think about in her question and, in, and the gentleman, the single parent, is we have a sector of our child care system that we have uh, not paid enough attention to, and that's home-based or family child care. Um, there is a network of family child care providers who provide care for children in their own home. It's a smaller setting. It's five or fewer children. Many parents who are looking for that small setting have unusual work hours, not nine to six, uh, have very young children that they'd like to see in a one-on-one -on -one relationship could benefit from home-based care. Um, we have not developed that enough in New Jersey. We treat it a little differently than we do family child care. And I think this is a time to create incentives for more people to be willing to register as family child care providers um, and provide care, especially to children who are using child care subsidies. Yeah, if we've got a couple of minutes left, let me ask you this, and 30 seconds or less. Why should anyone watching this program, children or not, grandchildren or not, help them understand, Winifred, why this matters to them directly and personally, and for us as a society who says we care deeply about our children? Winifred. Because how we hold the people who are holding our children will determine how these little people we're holding will grow up into society. Um, and so that's the reason why I feel like this should be just a universal issue that we all care about. So if someone says, that's not my kid, you say? I that's say, not my kid you're holding. That's not my grandchild you're holding, you say? But that kid that I'm holding may end up impacting you later on. They may be holding you. Well said. Assemblyman, take a shot at this. Why should well, people care? People should care again. Um, child care again, like I mentioned earlier, is too expensive, right? Teachers are not paid at the same parity like public schools are. They are not receiving uh, medical benefits. Um, they're, the child care centers are operating in very thin margins. So again, we go back to the attendance versus enrollment. So. I will tell, share with you, and I'll leave with this message, is that, you know, we should, yeah, ch child, care, child care centers are, um, they're not the public good that they should be, and they should be treated as the public good. And, you know, again, public schools are paid on enrollment, not attendance, and the same should apply to child care centers. Dr. Lee, tell folks why they should care. I think we value families, and by that we need to value the system of support that families need, and child care is an essential part of that system of support. And finally, Seal, someone says, this isn't, it doesn't affect me. It's, it's just not Some possible. Some of more basic. How do you more basic than this? We're all connected, right? Our state needs residents who are working, who are self-sufficient, and can pay taxes that support the rest of us all of us in New Jersey. And to do that, businesses, employers need staff. They need workers who can come to work, be focused on work, um, not absent. Um, and childcare is essential to creating that workforce. I feel strongly, I agree completely that childcare is the educational system for our youngest children. But from a practical reality, it's a financial engine for our state as well. I cannot thank this very distinguished, our very distinguished panel of experts on this reimagined child care town hall about this crisis. And people use the word crisis to overdramatize certain situations. That's not the case here. A genuine, real, substantive, longstanding crisis that uh, um, affects all of us. So I cannot thank you enough. I want to thank all of you for 
watching and uh, engaging in this important town hall meeting around this child care crisis. I'm Steve Adubato. We hope to see you next time. Think Tank with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding has been provided by the Turrell Fund, supporting Reimagine Child Care. PNC, Grow Up Great. The Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. The New Jersey Economic Development Authority. RWJ Barnabas Health. NJM Insurance Group, PSENG, Seton Hall University, and by the Northward Center. Promotional support provided by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association, and by NJ.com. Many of New Jersey's children have been affected by COVID-19, but now that there is a safe and effective vaccine available for children ages 12 and older, you can help make COVID-19 history by getting yourself and your child vaccinated. Let's end this pandemic together and help all children get back to being kids. Visit HagensackMeridianHealth.org slash COVID-19 to learn more or to schedule a vaccine appointment today.